Hey, what is up, everybody? Michael Crump back here again, talking about the latest and the greatest in PlayStation, homebrew news, and much, much more. So the highly anticipated part two of the Master Core Rada by Seaturt is now available. In this episode today, I want to talk a little bit about that article that just came out yesterday and really what's some of my thoughts on it so far. So let's just go ahead and jump straight into it. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page, back in March of the 23rd, Seaturt released this tweet which said, for a variety of reasons, it's time for me to move on from the PlayStation hacking scene and that he was thankful for the people that he met and he had a couple of different highlights. Now, one person put in here, thanks for everything, it seems Master Core Part 2 is not coming, which is exactly what I had thought when I saw this tweet come out. I was like, okay, what does that mean? Is that the end of the Master Core updates? And then we saw that he said, I'm considering publishing it, but it's only in a half-finished state. So fast forward to yesterday, we saw that there was this tweet that says, part two attacking the compiler process was out. Now he said, ultimately, I didn't finish the exploit, but hopefully it's still interesting and maybe we'll see a full exploit implementation from somebody else in the future. Obviously, my very first thoughts was, was that he said that he didn't finish the exploit. Now, just so you know, for Master Core Part 2, we were supposed to understand more about the compiler attacks. And ultimately, what really the hope was out of all of this was, was that some of the information that would be gathered in Part 2 could maybe give us some things such as running PlayStation 4 Homebrew on a PlayStation 5. So some of the great applications that we all know and love... PS Explorer, by the great and wonderful Lappy, Items Flow, any of those type of homebrew apps that we use, getting them to run on a PlayStation 5 would be absolutely amazing. And then also, we would obviously like to run at least PlayStation 4 games on a PlayStation 5. But it looks like a lot of these hopes have been diminished quite a bit, unless, again, somebody else that is familiar with this can take over this project. Now, let's go ahead and let's jump straight into part two of his article. So the very first thing that he says here was, was that in part one, basically I explained how I successfully escaped the PS2 emulator used in the PS4 and 5 through PS4 backwards compatibility to allow execution of native ROP chains. And since I know some folks may be asking about ROP chains, this is really a thing called return-oriented programming. An attacker gains control of the call stack to hijack the program control flow, and then it executes carefully chosen machine instruction sequences that are already present in the machine's memory. And then it says each gadget typically ends in a return instruction and is located in a subroutine within the existing program and or shared library code. So chained together, these gadgets allow an attacker to perform arbitrary operations on a machine employing these defenses so back over to the article here. The article in and of itself is talking a whole lot about the compiler process because that's really what this is about. Now, there are some interesting sections in here, and I'll just scroll down to this section, which is called Unfinished. He says, I never finished the exploit, sorry. And then he wrote out, but when summarizing the primitives outlined already, it seems reasonable that it would be possible to develop this into a complete exploit taking over the compiler process. Then there is also this discussion of the aftermath. And he said that for various reasons, the operating system was not designed to enforce games to be on their latest version. And so the fact that there are games with special privileges is an oversight in their security model, as it leaves privileged code with no readily available mechanism to be patched. 
And so he says in here, anyway, as I predicted, the PlayStation decided not to redesign their security model and build a mechanism for enforcement of game patches. Instead, they have accepted the reality of the JIT compiler processes potential being permanently compromisable and attempted to limit the consequences of this. He says that while I can only speculate on their motivations, I believe their main concerns regarding this scenario of this being used to load patched retail PS4 games into the process and trying to boot them, that PlayStation decided they could mitigate this risk by placing a limit on the amount of JIT code allocatable. It says this limit is 65 megabytes. Now, there is some information in here regarding it being the 65 megabytes, but you could potentially use a USB drive, for example, for the storage. There's a reasonably good chance that with enough motivation, the vulnerabilities described in this post could be exploited to take over the compiler process. The exploit would allow arbitrary code execution on the latest firmwares of the PS4 and 5, and more on that in just a second, allowing native homebrew applications to be run off USB storage, for example. Even with the mitigation, Sony shipped in response to this research to limit the size of applications that could be run. I still believe it would be possible to run larger applications, maybe even with performance overhead or them being partially emulated or dynamically paged in and out. With the amount of work required, I don't realistically think we'll see polished demos of Linux or retail PS4 games running, but it's fun to think that there's a good chance that theoretically those things might be technically possible. So we may have the ability to run those PlayStation 4 games on our PlayStation 5 right now, and it might could be done through this, but basically what c Turt is saying is, is that I don't have an answer for that. Maybe somebody else can kind of help figure that out, or really, can somebody else figure that part out? What is very interesting to me is, is that, obviously, he says, on the latest firmwares of the PS4 and the PS5. And, you know, just to mention, over on Macaulay's GitHub, the main MasterCore PS2 network game loader is still missing support for PlayStation 5 7.00 and up. So if we look at what is supported right now, we can see that there is support all the way up for the PS4 on 10.50, but the only thing that we have for the PS5 is at 6.50. And again, this was three weeks ago. And just to kind of let you know where we're at time-wise, the release of 7.00, which really still isn't the latest version, came out on March the 8th, 2023. So looking at today being April the 3rd, we're coming upon a full month of us having this out, and there still hasn't been support added for that yet. Now, I am very aware that the team has been looking at this and trying to get this to work on 7.00, but apparently there were some sort of changes that's happened in between 6.50 and 7.00 and then 7.01. So anyway, I just wanted to shed a little bit of light on that. I'm not sure if this is that helpful, but for the main part is, is that we have a Master Core Part 2. It's got a lot of great information about the compiler process that hopefully somebody else would be able to take that information and turn it into a full-fledged exploit. Really, what we're trying to do is more so for the PlayStation 5 to be able to run PS4 homebrew applications. I mean, it would be nice if on the PlayStation 4, 10.50, or 11.00 when it comes out for us to be able to run those applications there. But for the most part, there really isn't anything that I don't think that a PS4 9.00 
can't do at this current moment. So it really makes a lot more sense to be focusing on the PlayStation 5 as ultimately that's where we're all going to migrate to at one point. Well, anyway, I hope you got something out of this. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you on the next one. Michael out.